Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here today with all of you at CARLA 2020. I'm Victoria Thomas and one of the program advisors for CARLA and also one of the moderators for the many conversations we're having across the weekend. I was asked to talk about carving out one's place and to share some insights from my journey about how I carved out my place in the film industry. I have to admit that when I first heard the topic, I was torn between two moods. I was slightly amused and then I was also slightly confused. Partly because on one hand, I had never really considered the possibility that there was a place or that I had to carve out one or that I had been carving out one. And so for me, preparing for today has been a process of reflection on my journey, almost like a before and after special in the magazine. I had to think back to where I started, what my expectations were at the time, where I wanted to be and where I exist today. Currently, I occupy two places, one as a filmmaker and the other as a film educator. As a filmmaker, I work across documentary and fiction. As a film educator, I'm currently the course director for a master's in international film business program at London Film School. And the question I guess I was trying to answer when I was doing all this reflection was whether or not I did carve out a place deliberately and consciously or whether it was subconsciously, you know, did these places spring up because I was reacting to the world around me? Or is it possible that I exist in a place that I actually had no say in creating, but it was a place that was created by the dominant culture and I was forced to exist in it? I know I went into the film industry full of energy, thinking I was there to learn about the tricks of the trade, to be able to make action and thriller movies and sell them. But because I knew no one in the industry, I felt like going back to university, film school quite specifically, was a way to learn about the industry and find the pathways to a film career. Because when I first went to university, I was 16 years old, I was really young. And back then I was there to study for what was considered a normal job by my family, which was to train as a lawyer. When I went to film school, I was in my late 20s which means that by that time, I had had a lot of university education already and lots of years in the working world as well. So this was very much a conscious career change for me. But I wasn't sure whether it was going to work out and I knew I had a backup plan in law. And so I enrolled in the film school and told no one in my family. I could keep it a secret because I skipped town. I moved from England to Scotland and I walked out that the train journey between London and Birmingham with Edinburgh was about five hours. So nobody in my family was going to be stopping by on an ounce anytime soon. And it worked. I could literally explore having a film career in a film school without anybody in my family finding out. And that was hilarious. But what I discovered when I got to this film school was a curriculum that it reflected the world that the artists lived in at the time through the screening programs, because we had to watch a lot of films and we had to talk about them. And that was actually something I was looking forward to because, you know, I enjoyed watching films. But when you're making film in a world that was legally racist, sexist, or homophobic at the time, chances are if your art is reflecting that world, you're probably gonna posit those images as incredibly normal. What I was not prepared for was the fact that my tutor, who was curating the screening program, was very rigid and adamant that only art could be discussed and not politics, which was what he considered the overt racism and sexism to be. And here I was, I was black, I was female, and having to sit through a lot of abuse in the name of art. During tutorials that were one-to-ones, when we were trying to talk about the films that we wanted to make as short films for our portfolios, I discovered that a box existed when you looked like me. Women made films about women's issues. Africans made films about poverty, war, AIDS in Africa for European audiences. And I wanted to make crime and legal thrillers because, you know, I'd spent my years in the legal world. And I was told quite pointedly that that was not my voice. I find that really hilarious. I knew the industry had a gender problem because of course the statistics were widely publicized. So I figured that maybe part of the issue was that I was a woman. And like most places in the film industry, even the film school and the faculty was dominated by men. And so I wanted to actively seek out female spaces 
Unfortunately, at the time, there was a lot of energy around women in film in the UK. And so I began to sort of engage with these spaces, thinking that, well, I could potentially find, you know, like-minded women who wanted to make legal and action thrillers. And I found them. But what I also found in these women in film spaces was that a lot of the times when they talked about women, the assumption was that women were white. And so in the diversity conversation and campaigns, it wasn't abnormal to hear, and I think we still hear that a lot in the UK, women and BAME. And I remember talking to somebody who was organizing a scheme um, in the film industry for women and BAME filmmakers that were underrepresented. And I sort of asked her what I thought was a rhetorical question. And I said, what am I supposed to apply as? And she was like, what do you mean? I was like, well, you know, you're looking for women and BAME filmmakers. I would love to apply, you know, because you reached out to me and said, we are looking for people from underrepresented groups. And she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we, we have women, but of course there's room for BAME people too. Now BAME, for those of you who don't know what it means, it's a casual term in the UK for everybody that's not white. And it's an abbreviation, which means black and minority ethnic. And she didn't get the point that I was trying to make. And so I spelled it out for her. And I was like, well, you do realize that I am BAME, but I'm also a woman. And there was this awkward silence that let me know that she had not really thought about it. Because one of the things that I frequently found in the women's spaces was that women were assumed to be white. And so yet again, I began to feel that perhaps that was not a place for me. Nowadays, there's a name for it, intersectionality, but back then there wasn't. So I thought that maybe I would try the place where I was not likely to look like an other, Africa. A lot of people there were black and looks just like me. So I went on this journey, Nigeria specifically. I probably deserve a Guinness Book of World Records for having the most stolen and appropriated intellectual property prior to the original scripts being made in the wild west of Nollywood. And I also discovered that distinctions were being made between Africans that lived and walked in the continent and those that did not. I was now not African enough in Africa as an African who also happened to be British. And that qualification, quite interestingly, was being made by a lot of European funders who were now the primary curators and funders of African storytelling initiatives. And that's when maybe I actively decided to carve out a space, a space where I had to stop asking for permission, permission to be a filmmaker, permission to be a woman, permission to be African, just permission to be. So I came back to the UK quite content to be what I realized people in the diaspora are, citizens of nowhere. And what I then decided to do, I guess, was to try and get the business knowledge so that I could create the infrastructure that would allow me to have my creative freedom and tell the stories that I came into the industry to tell. Legal and crime, thrillers and action movies. And now that I am doing that, some of the same people who stood in my way with all these qualifications about what I should be doing or not are now saying to me, well, you're doing so much, why? And I have only one answer for every one of those people. I quite simply had to. <laughs>